We are going to start, because why not? So we're talking about the dark net. I'm here with Alex Winter, documentary filmmaker, uh, producer and director of Deep Web, a movie about the dark net, the Silk Road, and the Silk Road trial. And Andy Greenberg, who's a senior writer at Wired, who covered the Silk Road trial and also has written extensively about the dark net in his book, uh, I'm sorry, it's like my favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> this Machine Kills Secrets. This Machine Kills Secrets, um, which is a really great book. And I'm Sarah Jong, I'm a contributing editor at Motherboard, and I also cover the Silk Road. Um, so this is like a little reunion of sorts. It really is, yeah. yeah. Thankfully not in a federal court building room. So. <laughs> Actually, Sarah and I sat next to each other for pretty much every day of the Silk Road trial. So yeah, just not, not speaking, not looking yeah, at each just other. Just writing frantically yes. with an actual pen on paper. Yeah. yeah, we weren't allowed to bring our computers in. It was, it was for us, just the And then the, the day would thing. end and you guys would all go scrambling <laughs> yeah. at a thousand miles an hour to yeah. different Starbucks to go. Uh, to find wireless, Put yes. your stories in. Anyway, Yeah. oh, the old fun romping days of the federal criminal trial. <laughs> so, right. yeah, mm. so the, the Deep Web is uh, the documentary that you just put out. Mm -hmm. Um, but before that, you put out a documentary about Napster. Mm -hmm. And those aren't unrelated. It's not just that it's, oh, they're about computers. Right. To you, those are actually very much linked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Um, in fact, I, I mean, I, I sort of looked at the deep web as a continuation of the conversation I started with Downloaded, um, not rea realizing I knew a fair amount about, um, about I knew a lot about uh, the dark net and, and cryptography, but I didn't know I learned a lot about Silk Road as it went along. Um, but I didn't even realize at the time how sig similar they were. Um, it was one of those really eerie things that the further into it I went, the more um, I started connecting the dots between the two. Um, they were both centralized server systems that were based on trust. Uh, they were both sort of watershed uh, online communities that were uh, mostly written about uh, for their provocative sort of outer components, which was file sharing in the Napster case and drugs in the Silk Road case, where there actually were different motives underlying the reasons for those technologies. You had this kind of, you know, Ross Albrecht, this idealistic, young, reckless, naive person uh, creating one, and you had Sean Fanning, who you could argue was similar on, on many levels, uh, creating the other. So. Uh, and then you had the spawning of all of these other services that came after the demise that eventually led to, to decentralized systems, um, BitTorrent in the case of Napster, and there's many uh, in the case of Silk Road. So it's really been kind of uncanny, actually, how many similarities there are. And they go on and on from there. There's sort of political ramifications that are similar and all kinds of things. But, um, you know, for me, I was interested, I've always been interested in online communities and their, their value in the, what makes them uh, sort of uh, areas challenging for us from an ethical and moral level. They're not easy to deal with, but I find them very interesting to tell stories about because of the duality or the, the conflicts at their heart. Um, and I met uh, Andy because of his, uh, of his book and his writing um, and, uh, and was really taken by the book as well uh, because I also, I just really identified with his uh, passion for the sort of connecting the, the historical dots all the way from the early cypherpunks to what had happened to in present day. So, thanks. A little background. Yeah, I mean, Andy, you've been covering the Silk Road for a long time, like so, so long, in fact, that your writing was very nearly evidence in the, in the case. Um, yeah, although the yeah. judge threw it out yes, as because, rank hearsay. Yes, um, because, or because, double, because... Double hearsay, in fact. Well, somehow. triple okay. hearsay even, maybe. You, you probably uh, can explain what that means. But, yes, um, but, you know, it, all, all Sarah it means went to law that. school, so... Um. Um, but, yeah, you were actually covering the story before the Silk Road was even the Silk Road. Right, so I, I discovered the dark web, by which I really mean Tor, this anonymity software, and specifically the use of Tor to run a Tor hidden service, which is when a, a server runs Tor to be basically a publicly accessible but anonymous website. I discovered this whole thing through WikiLeaks because in 2010 I did an interview with Julian Assange that turned out to be right before his giant cable gate release and I sort of became obsessed with figuring out how he had pulled this off, how what Assange did that made him like a super journalist it seemed. And the 
thesis of the book I ended up writing as a result was that it was basically that he had used the, these cryptography tools as his superpower, that um, he had used Tor, he had, he had basically used cryptographic anonymity to not just sort of promise anonymity to sources who leaked him secrets or whistle, blew the whistle, but to technically um, ensure with mathematical certainty that nobody could identify them. That's what WikiLeaks was all about because it, you know, the WikiLeaks submission system ran as a Tor hidden service. So I was already kind of obsessed with Tor and my book, as Alex said, like traced the whole history of the cypherpunks, this group that wanted to use encryption to take power from the government and give it to individuals. And uh, you know, my book also traced how Tor was created. So I was already looking at all these Tor hidden services all the time and then I saw this one called the Silk Road that seemed to want to offer drugs for sale and I was like, this is some hippie experiments. This is not going anywhere. And then- um, You were then, right about half of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. And, and then actually Adrian Chen's story um, was when I realized like, actually this is a really big deal and I wish that I'd written about it when I discovered it. Um, but anyway, You caught up uh, pretty quick. Yeah, so then I, uh. I became obsessed with the Silk Road and I saw it as like the next story about the dark web, about um, anonymity on the internet and eventually got to interview the Dread Pirate Roberts um, who ran the Silk Road, this pseudonymous figure and that's I think what brought, got Alex's attention and we ended up, I ended up just, you know, getting, appearing in, in Alex's film. Yeah, just to, just to uh, before we go on to the next thing, the, it was interesting because I had, I had been reading your stuff in the magazines and then I was actually, well, I was on a shoot in a, here in LA on, on, some, on a narrative that I was working on and the producer said to me, you know, because it downloaded, oh, you should be doing something in this space and we kind of already were. We had started to put together a movie around Bitcoin and the dark net. And uh, he's like, you should meet with Andy Greenberg because we're going to, you know, try to make a movie out of, <laughs> out of that book for the Hollywood thing. And uh, he's not talking to me anymore, that guy. But uh, mm. we, um, we kind of connected through that. And, and I say that it's interesting because uh, this, this story was a really interesting experience in terms of watching journalists up close, because uh, the movie was, was made in real time. And, um, and watching the way Hollywood and other, um, other media outlets uh, responded to the story and even the way that they interacted with the journalists um, has been a really interesting experience for me to watch um, on a number of levels, but uh, you know, not the least of which, you know, trying to sort of bend a story sort of the way that you want it to go and sort of trying to get even the journalism community to bend that way with you. Uh, interesting. Yeah, can I just say, I think that yeah. one of the really interesting things about Alex's film, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's, you know, it's like number one on iTunes documentary right now. Um, and we got uh, kicked off by Steve Jobs, but we held strong for a while. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, it, he, you know, he, a, a lot of it is about the media perception of the Silk Road, which has been sort of this true crime story. And Alex, to his credit, I think, saw that it was like a political thing as well, that Ross Ulbricht created the Silk Road as a kind of libertarian socioeconomic experiment that yes, like potentially, uh, I think, grew into a, a massive criminal enterprise as well. But it is, I think it's worth noting that the Silk Road had those kind of idealistic or ideological roots and that's a big part of Alex's movie. I think going back to your interview with the Dread Pirate Roberts, which is really interesting because it's kind of what led you to meet up with Alex and it, it also almost showed up in the trial or rather was attempted to be introduced into evidence. Um, it, like how did you, how do you talk to these sources? Like both of you in doing, in doing the documentary and in doing your coverage, you've had to basically talk to extremely paranoid people who are paranoid for a very good reason, who use very sophisticated technology. So you have to use sophistic, sophisticated technology as well. Like what technologies do you use? What are some of the challenges there? And like, are these things that people in this room need to also learn how to use? Well, I think, you know, I, I wish that I could say that I, I educate sources about what they need to do to be safe when they talk to me, but it's much more often the other way around. And I, when I started, you know, when I wanted to interview Julian Assange, I just ended up talking to WikiLeaks people who are like, if you want to talk to so-and-so, you need to install Pigeon in OTR, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a encrypted chat tool. Um, and then, you know, if I, so I, 
that's always the way it works, basically, is like I follow their rules. Because the people I'm talking to are usually mm -hmm. savvier than the average source. They're like hackers and cypherpunks. So it was the same with the Silk Road. I was in his world already. I was lurking on, this, on the Silk Road forums, which is another Tor hidden service. So, and then I eventually interviewed him also on his terms, you know, he, I, I was like, I want to interview, inter interview you, tell me how best to do this. I can meet you in an undisclosed location in a foreign country if you want. I was thinking maybe we could like go to the Bahamas or whatever. <laughs> but um, he, he turned me down on that and like refused to. He was like, I don't meet in person even, even with my closest advisors. Um, and so he instead made me a kind of uh, temporary drug dealer on the Silk Road. He gave me a vendor account to somehow make things easier. And then uh, <laughs> we exchanged messages through the Silk Road messaging system, and that's how I interviewed him. So that was totally his system. You know, it was a tour hidden service, but more than that, it was like his software that he built that we were using. Yeah, it was funny to be inside the story at this time and in, in these times, because we're living in this sort of transition in this post-Snowden era when you know, when I started telling this story several years ago, um, encryption tools were still really cumbersome. And there was a million of them, and they would change every week. And, you know, you'd be, and I was talking to an enormous amount of people through encryption because I was trying to weed out, you know, as many of the sort of Silk Road architects and, and those people as I could to get to the people that I thought would have substantive things to say. And every one of them had a different system. And it was really confusing. I mean, I'm pretty savvy with this stuff. It was really confusing. And I would screw it up. And like, and it was really, you know, like chewing gum and string. Or like they had to talk to you at a certain time. And like, I was like, oh my god. And I'd run to my computer. And like, the damn thing they wanted me to use wouldn't work. Or like, <laughs> there was some aspect of my Wi-Fi that wouldn't function with the OTR. Or like, whatever it was. And it was just a, it was a total like broken down. It's like, it was amazing to me. That was one of the things really early on about the Silk Road, frankly, that showed me the disparity between what we were being told in, in the media for the large part and what was actually going on. Because to actually get away with crime on the Silk Road required enormous technical savvy. I mean, like rock solid. The fact, because there was so much law enforcement up inside that thing, there were so many people just watching every single thing they did and waiting for one little mistake. And on the internet, one little mistake is, is your undoing, just one. And there I was, I'm pretty tech savvy, you know, I've been around longer than a lot of people, and I'm just like totally failing, trying to simply just say, hello, L-O-L, you know, <laughs> and get like a couple of words from them about something, much less run drugs through the postal system around the world. So, you know, there, there are people that are in just on a completely different level from us. I agree with Andy that you sort of follow their lead, but even they would be struggling with the, with the dis disparate types of technology. Today it is different, I mean, today, there are, you know, sort of core technologies that work and have functionality. Even Tor is crazy easy now with the Firefox uh, mm -hmm. situation. And um, PGP is a lot easier and baked into most of your uh, email accounts if you want it to be that way. Uh, Wicker works incredibly well. There's just basic systems that work incredibly well that are real. Um, but that's, it's changing and it's new that that's the case. So would you say, and you've somewhat answered my question here, but would you say privacy tech is easy to use or do you think it's still too complicated, especially for journalists? I think, I think it's, it, the thing about it is complicated. Snowden made that really great comment about Silk Road when he was talking to Bruce Schneier, which sums it all up, which is, which is encryption is useless if you're not sealed tight on the other end, meaning I think it is difficult for journalists because at the end of the day, Encryption is either, it's like a switch, it's either on or off, and if you screw it up, it's off. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, 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 and I was dealing with sources that I didn't want, I didn't want to be the reason they went to jail. It wasn't like I exonerated them, it's just I didn't, I didn't want to be the reason they went to jail, and I didn't want the Fed showing up at my door going, what are you doing talking to Fred? You know, so we were really trying to maintain ironclad security, and if you screw up a little bit, like I was saying, trying to scramble to get Threema to work or some of these more obtuse security applications that never worked, I was really nervous that I'd you know, blown someone's cover and that you know, they had entrusted me or that if I wasn't maintaining encryption on my laptop carefully, that our communications, while they had been encrypted, once they're unencrypted for me to read them, you know, did they remain in some unencrypted state on my computer by accident? You know, all of these things that, that you, it was an enormous amount of labor 
Mm -hmm. I mean, enormous amount of labor, and it was continual labor in order to keep my communication with these people secure. And I'm sure that's the same for them, but it's, there are many, many ways in which you can screw up. Um, so the, short, the, the long answer, I should say, is that no, it's not easy, and yes, it's important. Andy? I think, I think it's, but I, that's true. I think it's getting a lot easier, though, and, um, PGP is way too hard. Um, that's like something we've been using since the 90s. It remains <clears throat> somehow what everybody thinks is like the best way to make initial contact over an encrypted channel. But it's so you know it's it's so difficult to use correctly. Like your colleague earlier today, Lorenzo, I saw him tweet that um, what do you do if someone has posted a public key with your name and it's not you, oh, just God. asking for a friend. Um, that's a really serious problem because a lot of us have public keys, you know, so that someone can encrypt a message so that only we can read it. But then we don't bother with the whole process of getting our keys signed by other trusted people so that people are, you know, as sure as possible that that, that is in fact our key and not a key that is being is spoofing us. So, because if someone tried to encrypt an email to Lorenzo but then accidentally encrypted it with the, P, you know, the NSA's fake Lorenzo key, then the NSA can read that email in transit. That's a big problem. It, that, you know, we shouldn't have to figure all this out. Um, but then, so PGP is, is dumb and it sucks. <laughs> and there are, but there are much better options like Signal, uh, this app for iPhone, or the equivalents on Android, which is interoperable, is, are these two apps called Tech Red Secure. Phone and Text Secure. Those are really easy to use. Yeah. Wicker the, is really good. Wicker is also great. That's um, how all the cyberpunk guys would communicate with me. You know, Alex mentioned endpoint security as being a big problem. I think that's definitely true on a desktop. That's not as true, I don't think, on an iPhone. An right. iPhone is like the most secure consumer operating system that's basically ever existed. Uh, last week, this uh, you know, spy contractor firm put up a million dollar bounty for an exploit for an iPhone. That's a lot of money just to hack an iPhone. It shows how hard it is. So, you know, there are, it's, it is, yes, so like doing true operational security as a reporter is really difficult, but there are these kind of rays of hope and certain things you can do that, that definitely do work and are easy. It's going to get way easier really yeah. fast. That's the, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. that is, it, it is like, I think that that's the direction things are going and um, I'm, I'm really glad to, to see things progress that way. I think that one of the things that's really scary about sort of operating in this world and handling this technology is like you said, like you don't want your sources to have to go to jail because of you, yeah. right? Um, but at the same time, so you're, you're juggling two things. One is like you wanna protect your sources, but you also wanna verify your sources. How yeah. do you verify a source that is, you know, hell bent on staying anonymous and not leaking any information about themselves that could possibly lead right. law enforcement to track them down? Yeah, my, well, my situation was a little different because a lot of people that I was trying to talk to were from the Silk Road, and the Silk Road had published their keys. Mm -hmm. So it was easier for me, and this is getting a little technical, but it was easier for me to verify a lot of those. Right. And then I was able to cross-reference those with other people that I knew within the organization that could verify that they were the right, accurate key. Um, and that's why I said I waded through so many people because unless I was 100% sure I was talking to the yeah. person who said that's who yeah. I was talking to, I didn't bother with them at all. Um, and then there were other forms of verification that once we got to each other, they were sending me information that was clearly only information they would have known. Um, and then even in some, I mean, and then I really would, I mean, if you see the movie, I really would hold it down. I didn't end up really util using that many people, like really a handful. And partly that was a verification issue. I was just 100% sure I knew who they were. Mm -hmm. And and not, their, I don't know where they live, like, you know, a lot of people, I don't know their real name, I don't know, you know, some of them I do, some of them already went to jail or struck pleas, and so they don't, you know, they're okay with me knowing who they are. Um, others are at large, and I don't know who they are, I don't want to know who they are, but I knew that I was talking to that person from Silk Road. Right. Um, and there, there were very, very, very few of those. It was very hard to verify those people in a rock solid way. Luckily for my needs, I didn't need that many of them. It's much harder, I think, in the world you guys are in where you're not dealing with, you know, all the time with these technologies where people, because the Silk Road was interesting. Because it had a political agenda, the reality is a lot, a lot of people did want to talk to me. You know, they were using the Silk Road as a, as a, 
as a platform for their agenda. So, you know, that was one of the earliest forms of evidence that I had that these, this was not simply a drug market. Because these, you know, the people that were there that were primarily selling drugs, they were kind of interested in talking to me. They were like, you know what, I don't care about politics. I have a wife and four kids, and I like sell selling marijuana, the end. And I got some of those. I didn't really have much to talk to them about. But the political people who were actually higher up wanted to talk. Um, and so they were going out of their way to help me verify their identity. Well, in the case of like the of talking to the drug pirate Roberts, for instance, I guess I knew that I wasn't going to verify his identity. I was just going to verify his pseudo identity. Like yeah. I was really interviewing a persona more than a person. Like um, the the drug pirate Roberts, you know, I, I could tell it was him because he controlled his account. He signed messages with his with his key so that you know he cryptographically was proving that it, it was him. Um, Yes, like there's a question about whether there were more than one Dread Pirate Roberts. I, do, I um, don't actually believe that there were, but that's you know up for debate. But I, I think all three of us might have different opinions. Yeah, about exactly. <laughs> but the reality of it is, you were talking to the person who was controlling the site, yes. whatever they were right, calling themselves, right. and that's right. what mattered. Yeah, we're getting into some deep epistemological yeah. questions yeah. here. <laughs> like, who is the Dread Pirate Roberts? Like, what is personal really? identity? Philosophically. Yeah. Um, right. But, but you know, I, I, when I, I asked him, like, you know. Where do you live? How old are you? Who are you? What's your real name? And he just said, you know, just, just, just he, he just of went course, ASL. was like, yeah. <laughs> um, mind your own business. Let's talk about other stuff, yeah. which was, of course, I just had to ask. But, you know, I was really asking him the, the, the stuff that he really wanted to answer was like, why are you doing this? What is this all mm -hmm. about? Like, um, what is your real role on the site? What is the future of the Silk Road? On the other hand, he also lied to me about. I'm pretty sure he lied to me about some things. He said that he had that he wasn't the, the Dread Pirate Roberts that I spoke to said that he wasn't the creator of the Silk Road, that he had acquired it um, from its creator. And I think that that was actually misdirection. Yeah, because we saw the diary entry later in the in the trial. Right. Talked to Andy Greenberg today, told yeah. him that I was the second Dread Pirate exactly. Roberts. <laughs> Went over well. Yeah. And the FBI, yeah. in fact, before the trial even like told me that he had lied to me about that. Um, so, you know, I I think if I remember that I couched that in my story as like, this is what he's telling me, mm -hmm. this is unfair, you know. It, so it, you have to be careful. Um, he, you know, it, it was easy for him to lie to me about details, but yeah. that doesn't mean that like you can't interview a pseudonym and still get useful responses. Right, but you have to be careful. And yeah. the other thing is like not only sort of the question of there being multiple people controlling a pseudonym, which that, that raises some interesting problems as far as verification goes, but um, one of the things we saw at the trial actually was that a lot of the Silk Road moderators were, well at least a couple, were um, cops. They, they had been taken over by uh, Homeland Security agents or DEA, and uh, so the pseudonym, this per the same persistent pseudonym, it's the same account, is now suddenly someone else, or they were a cop all along, right? Yeah. So when you're talking to them, like that's, that's going to be a little... A little, a little different. Like, did you guys have any like apprehensions about? I guess uh, I, I took certain steps to make sure that I was talking to the right people, and I can't actually say yeah. much <laughs> about what I did. Um, but I did. Uh, it was a little scary, actually. Yeah. But so uh, it, it, this is just this is we're just in yeah. But I had to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, there was certain information that I was getting that was important enough to my understanding of the story that I needed to verify it continually, or at least at certain time intervals that I was talking to the same person. So there was ways that I figured out how to do that. Um, and uh, and then there was you know there were, yeah yeah, but it's it's uh, it is unnerving, and. You know, the reality of it is, is that your sources, you have to, I mean, for me, and I'm not a journalist, so it's, it's just like when I'm, when I was doing this story, when I've done other stories, it's just about continual verification, right? Like, are you just continually verifying the story from other angles, from other people that you know within the story? And you end up with this, this sort of entity that, that has verisimilitude, that, that, that holds up. And when it doesn't, you have to find out why it doesn't, like what, where things went off the rails. And... So there's many, you know, it's a very intense process. I mean, sort of telling this story in real time was a crazy intense process for that reason. It's just constant verification. And then everything was changing every five minutes, you know. Alex talked about, I think, a lot, you talked a lot more of the 
dealers and sort of like a lot more people on the Silk Road than I did. I kind of like sought out the Dread Pirate Roberts and was. <laughs> you went for the main event. Yeah, I kind of dumped. Well, I, actually, I had no option of I, doing that, so that was not right, open to me. Right. I did actually, I talked to a lot of dealers too, but they, I, I didn't um, do any of that kind of, I think face-to-face -face verification that you often did. And um, you, know, you did on-camera interviews with mm -hmm. people and stuff. So, uh, that's different. I, I did interview a lot of dealers who said things. I was like, that, that, does, that sounds kind of weird. I don't know if I really believe you about that, and I just threw it out. Um, so, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I have covered Anonymous, the hacker collective movement, whatever, a lot, too. That was, that's an incredibly challenging thing, and I've definitely seen a lot of reporters get completely snagged by, like, mm -hmm. um, people just making up entire identities that are BS. Well, they'll end up trolling you. Um, I mean, that's the problem with that community is they will, right. in certain circumstances, they will absolutely go after you yeah. and build elaborate ruses to send you down a blind alley to you know, penalize you for whatever they assume to be your transgression against their organization, right. uh, which doesn't take much for some of those people. But yeah, that's a, it's a mind, bit of a minefield. I was a little worried about that at certain points. Um, but again, I wasn't dealing with Anonymous, so. So one of the things you guys were both, well, we were all covering something that was a lot of our subjects were either under law enforcement scrutiny. Um, in fact, the, the most coveted sources were going to be the ones that law enforcement were, were actively looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's even when you're not interacting with sources that are law enforcement targets, it's interesting because when you report on this stuff, you are, I mean, look at, look at how the Silk Road blew up. The Silk Road blew up because Adrian Chen wrote a story about it in Gawker. And you can see actually in the, in the trial documents that the Silk Road was nothing before that Gawker article. As soon as the Gawker article came out, their user base jumped up 10 times, and then the Silk Road became a phenomenon, mm -hmm. and that ended up launching Chuck Schumer's attention. And then once Senator Schumer's attention was on the Silk Road, uh, it was only a matter of time before the US attorney came after um, Ross Ulbricht. Right. And so it's almost as though there's this like big ethical question, like by engaging with any of this, like are we eventually putting people in prison, right? Or eventually like spurring on the drug trade or any of any of these things? Yeah, I think that, I mean, and Annie, I'm sure will be able to speak to this in more detail, but I, I know that for myself, um, my only concern was, was, I had two concerns. One was not to put anyone in prison and not to impact Ross's trial. And I remember saying that to Cindy Cohn, who's the, well, she was chief legal for the Electronic Frontier Foundation at the time. Now she's running the EFF. But, um, you know, she and I had a long conversation about this. And, and it was really important to me that I not impact Ross's trial um, so that I keep the information that I have. If I felt that I had information that it would impact the trial one way or the other, I kept that to myself. The movie wasn't about that on a certain level, sort of exonerating him or not exonerating him. So. Um, sort of uh, frame my narrative a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, and then the other rule that I had was, was, as I said, was not getting any of my sources put in jail or allowing them to feel that, um, that I would protect them. And I had a lot of legal assistance for that. For, you know, from the entertainment industry side, I had kind of the, you know, the guys that did Citizen Four and they do all the sort of big stuff that, that it requires. You know, and I would call them like, I'm about to sit down with somebody and blah, 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 what do I do? You know, or someone just asked me this, what do I say? You know, I was just super, super careful. And, you know, I would do things like if I shot actual people that, you know, were sources, then we didn't retain any um, form of, of visual image that showed any part of their, of their identity and all that stuff was destroyed and nothing is left other than, you know, baked in um, images. So, you know, we did a lot. Uh, we took a lot of precautions, uh, ethically and morally, um, my general feeling about it was similar to Napster, which was, was, and I know the stakes are higher on some level, but, you know, I wasn't really worried about, I knew that I had no ability to, to, um, to get anybody hurt. You know, the film wasn't a rallying cry for the Silk Road, but by the same token, um, I felt very morally and ethically comfortable with my position on the Silk Road and the fact that I was dealing with a bunch of grown-ups who had made certain life decisions and that they had made a decision to talk to me, which they didn't have to do. 
and they'd made a decision to go public with certain aspects of what they believed in, which they didn't have to do. Um, beyond that, I wanted to propagate their message, not as, again, as a, an act of advocacy, but because I think it's really worth talking about as, an, as a story that's occurring in our culture right now. So I'm, I was very comfortable with that. Has that received a backlash of some sort? You expect one? Of course it does. Some people are going to hate what you're doing. Some people are going to, I mean, a lot of, you have to expect, when you make documentaries, it's probably different than what you guys do. You have to assume that, that you know, you walk in a room and you interview people and you have the greatest time. And the sad reality of it is, is when it's over, most of them are going to hate you. And, you know, I've, been, I've done it long enough that I just know that to be true. And, and that's okay. I don't mind if a lot of my subjects hate me. Because for whatever reason, they feel like I didn't say that one thing that they thought I needed to say or that the message of the film isn't what they like, or this or that. Um, so I don't mind any of that, you know. But the minefield is obviously I don't want anyone, I don't want anyone to get hurt on my watch because of something that I've done. I don't think movies are that important. Well, I guess I should, <clears throat> I, I don't think that um, my interview with the Dread Pirate Roberts helps anybody to catch him, for one thing. Like, uh, just, I, I'm not, I don't think you're saying that either. But the, the what's the DHS, the DHS, at one point, the Daily Dot, Patrick Howell O'Neill, got a copy of my interview that had been like highlighted by the DHS. They were like looking for clues in it, and clearly they found nothing. I mean, he was he you know was a careful guy who, and I was talking to him on his terms. I wasn't trying to trick him or anything. Or I, I couldn't have if I had tried. So I don't think I helped law enforcement. The question of like whether covering the Silk Road, you know, um, enables it or whether there's this like Heisenberg problem of like, are we affecting the things? Well, of course we affect the things mm -hmm. we cover. And I think you kind of nailed it in the way you described it. Like, yes, um, Adrian Chen's story made the Silk Road. Yes, and then also it, it made the reaction to the Silk Road. It, it launched both the Silk Road and the law enforcement's you know, um, crazy amount of resources put towards taking it down. So that's what journalism always does. And if you, you, know, if you think the Silk Road is good, Expose that if you think it's bad. Expose it anyway. If uh, if the if Ross Ulbricht ends up in prison, and you think that's bad, then you know cover his trial. And if you think if it's unjust, just keep exposing everything. That's what we do as journalists. It seems like that's that's um, how it works. Yeah, the beginning and the end is journalism. Yeah. <laughs> the, so you alluded to this a bit, um, Alex, but uh, maybe we can start with Andy's take on this. There's the Silk Road is sort of put out as a, a very technical story, right? It's, you know, it's got encryption, it's got drug dealers, um, um, you have sort of amoral actors and things like that, but it, it's, when it comes down to it, like, because we've sort of been in the trenches for a while, we know that there's very strong, there's a strong political undercurrent to this. It's, it's a very ideological um, area, story, arc, whatever. Um, and this has really deep roots, like all the way back to maybe the 90s, maybe even earlier. earlier like yeah. it's not a futuristic story, it's a retro story. Do you want yeah. to talk about that? Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, my book, the first half of it, which I think is like the part that Alex was actually interested in, because the second half is more focused on WikiLeaks specifically, so nothing to do with the Silk Road, is about the history of the, of the cypherpunks and crypto anarchy. Um, and you know, back in like 1993, Tim May and a bunch uh, like this kind of former Intel engineer who made a lot of money and retired and just spent the rest of his life thinking about how to use encryption to destroy the federal government as we know it. Um, you know, he founded this group called the Cypherpunks that became this really influential mailing list. You don't say those words together very much anymore, I guess. But um, <laughs> and they had all these ideas. They really developed a whole bunch of technologies. They came up with the idea of of Remailers, like a server that would bounce email so that um, you couldn't trace the source. That kind of is what became Tor, you know, in a much more rigorous, real time web speed way. Um, and Tim May had this idea for like a, an anonymous eBay that would use remailers. He actually was talking about selling black market information because he didn't believe that anybody would be so stupid as to send stuff through the postal system. It turns out that that, that actually worked pretty well. And Tim May was, you know, everything else that Tim May theorized, he called a black net, um, was spot on. I mean, totally. he, he basically- Cryptocurrencies, all of that stuff. And this is in 93. Right, he, he sort of imagined something like Bitcoin 
um, he didn't really have the, that had not been created. He, 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 I think he like, he called them crypto credits in his hypothetical thing. Um, but otherwise, you know, the, it was completely fleshed out in, in 15 years before it actually appeared. Um, and then all it took was for the technologies to actually be built. And Bitcoin, I think, was the one that kind of unlocked the whole thing. Um, this ability to have not truly untraceable, but potentially, if you use it carefully, untraceable cash on the internet is tr what made this Silk Road possible. And then suddenly all these ideas from the 90s, you know, um, became real. Yeah, and it's, it's not just, you know, like it wasn't just the Silk Road. We were seeing like assassination markets. Exactly, we're, we're yeah. seeing um, like hackers can hold your data hostage and then be like, you have to pay us in Bitcoin. And then they take the Bitcoin and run off after they give you back your data. Um, so it's, it, Bitcoin has really unlocked, unlocked a Absolutely. Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. um, but, it's the, but the Pandora's box is tied up with politics in the end. It's, it's not just sort of the wild imaginings of, um, you know, it's not just speculative. It's, it's tied up with a, with a real ideology, right, Alex? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're dealing with, with you know, the digital revolution has been, you know, the big watershed moments in the digital revolution. I mean, not the commercial ones, which are usually following other, other watershed moments or copying them or popularizing them the way iTunes did with, with Napster. Um, or, you know, they, they were always sort of sp uh, spurned on by these very often young, idealistic, brilliant, sometimes recklessly so, um, individuals. But they're, you know, they're, it's a very uh, political through line. It's an ide idealistic through line, even if it's not tied. And it's not tied to any, it's very non, it's not partisan. Um, there's always a lot of talk about, you know, that Silk Road was all libertarian or, or, you know, because of the writings of the Dred Pirate Roberts. But you're dealing mostly with uh, a sort of a more generalized sort of drive towards, uh, you know, public freedom and privacy and um, you know, sort of a resistance to the sort of growing um, uh, sort of institutions that encroach upon those things. And so you're dealing then with, with absolutely not just libertarians at all, but you, there's genuine anarchists in a group like that. There are people who are f fairly mild on either side of the political aisle in a group like that that have you know, aspirations towards that end. Something like Silk Road was really compelling because the Silk Road forums, which is where people communicated with each other, um, were a melting pot of very, very bright discourse for the most part. There was some goofy stuff like you would have in any bulletin board or forum. Um, but there was a lot of discourse about sort of where culture was going and how we can impact it and how we can use technology to impact it. So the technology is just a tool, for sure. You know, and every once in a while a mathematician comes along or someone who's got so much brilliance or just has a light bulb moment. Um, you know, whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is actually had the math to make Bitcoin work, which took some mathematical dexterity, but it was tied to a very pro-privacy ethos. Um, and it would not have been inspired without that ethos. And Sean Fanning, who when I met, immediately represented himself as, as by far the smartest human, human being I'd ever encountered, um, who was a physics whiz, math, I mean everything. He just could nail, he was doing robotics to relax when I met him, because um, he was stressed out from Napster. He was a brilliant, brilliant human being. Um, so every once in a while you get these guys who just connect and, and leap things forward in whatever way. But for the rest of us who aren't that brilliant, um, those ideals can really get a lot done in, in that technology space, but the technology is, is absolutely just a tool. So, and that's why it's so threatening. I mean, that's why a lot of these technologies are so threatening, because it's what's underneath them that is so threatening, and that was a big part of the, the issue with the way, I mean, I just want to tell one quick story about when, when I was working on the story, a lot of journalists from other publications, more mainstream publications than the tech publications, which got, which got the Silk Road story. I mean, they were really, like Forbes wired, Motherboard was kind of, was almost kind of it. You know, they got it, but that was it. And the, the sort of more, you know, sort of regular kind of New York Times, the further away you got from any even vague comprehension of what was actually going on. And they would call me and be like, I want to understand this, this deep web thing, you know, or how does this PGP thing work? And you would tell them, but they would never write about it. I mean, it really just go in one, I mean, just go in one ear, not the other. And, and you could tell there wasn't a mandate editorially for them to write about it. Like there was no impetus 
from within those publications to, to get it right and to tell the story. It was, literally, it was literally like it wasn't happening. And that was an interesting experience that I went through. On, uh, I literally did a seminar in New York City once during the filming where we got everybody, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, so we got everybody to come and we just explained everything to them. And we brought Ross's mother in and we brought other people in and we were like, this is what is going on, this is what's happening and this is how technology works. And they all nodded their head and left and never wrote anything about any of it. And when they did, it was just wildly inaccurate and just crazy superficial stuff. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting experience with, with the journalistic community on this movie in terms of who was actually interested in what was legitimately happening and who, obviously, there was just no impetus from above or from within their you know, area to cover it. It's also interesting to sort of, because this, the Silk Road is, is perceived to be a bit of a fringe thing, right? It's, it's a bit of a, um, not only is it, does it have like criminal overtones to it, but it's, you know, um, perhaps incorrectly, but I would, I would contest that. Uh, it's considered like you know a, a techno libertarian sort of um, stronghold inside of uh, a very obscure part of the internet that you can only get through through certain uh, steps that not everyone knows how to take, um, and yet you're sort of all of the the law enforcement paranoia around the dark net and around encryption, we're now sort of seeing that battle out in a like a real world, very corporate, very like business pages sort of way, mm -hmm. right? Like like this stuff with Apple and the FBI mm -hmm. and like the fact that your iPhone is like now the most secure device you can have. Like this is um, the stories of the Silk Road moving into our pockets every yeah. day. And is it is it possible to understand sort of the arc of where all of this is going without referring back to this like weird niche subculture story? <laughs> Andy? Well, uh, the, the cypherpunks in the 90s went through all of this before. They, you know, they called it the Crypto Wars. Some people yeah. call this Crypto Wars too that we're experiencing And some people now. say the Crypto Wars never ended. Right. I mean, some people, we, we, I guess some people thought we won the Crypto Wars the first yeah. time because we killed the idea of a back. Don't worry, I'm lost too. And, so don't um, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, yeah. So the, yeah. the crypto wars were over. Um, it sounds like the Phantom Menace. Yeah. Or like so I mean, so for a while, <laughs> encryption was was considered um, like weapons technology because the military used encryption, and if you so you couldn't export military grade encryption overseas because if you if you did that, that was uh, you know aiding the enemy or whatever, and um, so there was like a bill in the house to criminalize this and uh, there was this huge fight. It turned into this huge political thing and um, this 90s movement that Andy has written extensively about um, won the cryptos, crypto wars, I think, or so I, we thought. I, I think that they did, really, to be honest. I mean, the other part of that was that the, the, the federal government wanted to build back doors into, into yes. basically a sort of government approved encryption and everybody believes that the next step would be that only government approved in encryption is, mm -hmm. is allowed. And that would mean backdoors and all encryption in the US. Um, that was defeated. You know, a a backdoor is basically of, like if you have any kind of encrypted communication, the government, a, could the government can still it. go in and decrypt it because they're the government and they're allowed to do it. But that means that the technology company has to build that in ahead of time. I, th I think, I, I mean, it seems like I would say that Edward Snowden has revived the crypto wars because he exposed that the U.S. government has found all these ways to circumvent the encryption that we were using to, you know, read everything that we're saying. And so uh, technology companies have responded, like Apple, with default encryption for all devices. And that's, you know, got the government again saying, if you do this without any backdoor, then you're going to enable all kinds of nasty criminals. And so the same kind of uh, argument over absolute privacy versus um, some sort of government mandated backdoored privacy has come up again. Um, and it is absolutely the same thing that's happening in this little corner of the internet called the dark web. It's the same exact, the, the analogy is the same. You know, do we want to give people absolute privacy, absolute liberty to do whatever they want, if, even if they're gonna do some nasty things with it. I mean, there is a lot of child pornography that is traded and sold on the dark web. There's no denying that. But then, you know, there's also, um, it also is kind of, I think, I think kind of a release valve for the, um, 
the sins of the drug war in some ways. Like, people should be able to buy marijuana on the internet. It's not that big a deal. Um, ecstasy, marijuana, hallucinogens, those are the most popular products on the... Well, marijuana by far. On, yeah. the, on the dark web drug markets. And then the dark web is also used for things like WikiLeaks and anonymous whistleblowing. And now that's been integrated not just into kind of, you know, radical uh, whatever you would, you know, hacker sites like WikiLeaks, if you want to call them that, but into The Guardian and The Intercept and Forbes. We launched our own um, anonymous leaks emission system when I was there. So, you know, these tools, they're just tools. They're general purpose tools. They have good applications and bad ones. And it's really hard to throw them out, you know, just because people will do bad things with them. Yeah, I have a, I'll make this really short, but I have a very <laughs> vehement position on this. Um, you know, the problem that I had was was the sort of having their cake and eat it too issue. It was like, you know, it's true that the Silk, I mean, the reality is absolutely true what you said, that the Silk Road was a niche, right? It was this kind of techy little niche thing. And yet there it was on the cover of Newsweek. There it was on the cover of Time Magazine. There it was on the cover of Wired. There are, there are four mainstream Hollywood movies that are in active development about Ross and the Silk Road right now. There's a, there are three major TV series in active development about Ross Ulbricht right now, where millions and millions of dollars are already being spent towards the development of these stories. You know, Mr. Robot did incredibly well. Um, it's not niche in terms of the way it's being presented to the public through the media, it's just inaccurate. Mm. It's gone through this, this prism and shot out the other end in this wildly inaccurate, salacious, misconstrued fashion. It's understandable, you know, it's understandable that this sort of hoodie-wearing, miscreant character cliche that we keep getting over and over again is appealing like a comic book, it just doesn't happen to be true. You know, the truth is actually on the other side over here. It's not to say it's good, it's just different. It's not to say that this is all bad and this is all good, it's just different. We're not getting the facts. Um, sort of like that New York Times article where they talked about emojis, it wasn't like what they said. There was a New York Times article during the Silk Road trial that said, basically all the New York Times covered about Silk Road trial was that emojis had now hit the federal court. And when was, they hadn't, because there were no actual cost. emojis that were mentioned during the Silk Road trial at all. They were emoticons, and the guy didn't understand the internet or emojis, and he got that wrong. So even their dumb headline, which refused to get into the substance of this story, was inaccurate. So that's my point. It's not to say someone's saying it's bad and I'm saying it's good. It's just they're just wrong. So that's really, I think, the pro one of the problems that we face right now is that privacy is a very important deal. You know, the, this underground that created things like the Silk Road, they happen for a reason, they always bubble up to the surface. The fact that Apple's building this giant building up north right now that is largely off the back of technologies that were created by radicals that were examining peer-to-peer -peer and other forms of technology for more radical, idealistic reasons, this stuff bubbles up and it goes somewhere big. And this stuff will go somewhere big, too. And I think to Andy's point, you know, we are all dealing with the realities of the fact that our personal and private lives are being more and more violated and exposed. Whether you have an issue with the government or you're on the wrong end of the target Anthem Blue Cross hack or the Sony hack or the OPM hack, you know, uh, whether you found that your computer's gotten hacked and somebody is looking at your screen activity, there's all these different things that can happen to you on a daily basis, even when your credit card gets stolen over the internet. So, it's kind of inescapable what sort of niche through the Silk Road are people who are in very radical ways dealing with issues that we're all facing but don't exactly know what to do with yet. They're confusing to us. How much privacy should we have? Is this anti-government if I hide my information or am I just protecting my family? These are all challenges that we face and there's all these people who are working on, on them. And I think what's been frustrating is that there is so little actual factual re reporting on what's going on. And I think that that will happen, but I think it will be battling against an enormous amount of spin from the other side of the media that wants to sort of maintain these, these stereotypes. Um, but it's, it is bubbling up to the surface. It comes from somewhere for a reason. It does bubble, bubble up to the surface for a reason. It absolutely does. If it hadn't been Snowden, it would have been someone else. If it hadn't been Adrian Chen, it would have been somebody else, you know? 
Maybe it would have been Andy. It would have been Andy. Sorry, Andy. Andy. <laughs> it could have been you. Um, can I open up the floor to questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, if people want to ask questions, you can come up to the mic. Um, Even just, if it's I'll what just... on God's earth are you talking about? <laughs> well, in the meantime, uh, I mean, one of the things, yes. How you doing? So, um, Wall Street Journal, by the way. What occurs to me is, what's the sort of future of that story? And then the other part is, like, I guess the, the, there's a technical sort of um, gap between this reporting that needs to happen and, like, what the typical reporter knows how to do. So it's kind of like, what can we do to educate reporters to actually go after the stories, you know, that, are, that exist? Like, you know, I mean, that's that, you know, dealing with reporters on a day-to-day -day basis, I can tell you it's absolutely true that there is a huge gap and most reporters probably can't even get onto the dark net, let's say, to, to start doing this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, some thoughts about that. So I think that, and, and you guys can probably speak to the future of the story more than I can because you're, you're still covering dark net markets, but I think that as far as what reporters can do to, to cover dark net stories um, and just weird, niche technical stories in general is that there are actually like a lot of resources out there. Um, for instance, there are things called crypto parties that are hosted by activists around the world. And the, like people will just come volunteer their time, usually like at a hackerspace or even at like a library. And they'll show you how to use encryption technology, how to set up PGP, um, how to use Tor. It's, uh, it's pretty great. Like you just, you get a free training out of that. Um, and one of the things you have to realize is not only is encry encryption technology getting easier and easier to use, but there's all kinds of people who are trying to get onto the dark net right now, right? Like people want to buy their marijuana. And if those people can do it and those instructions are out there, by Jove, so can you. So can you. Um, Andy? I, th I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal has, is, is this mic still working now that yeah. I like this? Yes. Okay. Um, the Wall Street Journal is one outlet, you know, you guys have the resources to, to pay a technologist to come in and teach you this stuff. Like Runa Sandvik, who used to work for Tor and is just like a great privacy technologist. She, I think, is, is like working as a consultant in this field and can, she's really good at teaching people how to, teaching journalists specifically, uh, how to protect themselves and their sources. Um, I think you asked, did you ask, was there another part of the question that was like, where is this what, going? Where, like, what's the future of the story? Yeah. Is that the, yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, I think the, I've always seen th this as like a story about the technology and, and you know, the, the people like Julian Assange or Ross Ulbricht come and go and then the technology keeps evolving. And there, are, you can see that this is happening with the dark web markets in the sense that when the Silk Road was taken down, there has been like 15, 20 other sites that have launched and several of them have grown bigger than the Silk Road selling tens of thousands of different drugs. Um, it's many, many of them have less scruples than the Silk Road did. Like, you know, the, the principles are a kind of temporary thing, but the technology remains. So um, the, this one site, Evolution, started selling stolen credit cards, too. I'm sure that there will be some that mix in, you know, child pornography with all kinds of hard drugs and guns and awful things, you know. That hasn't actually happened, but you can see that the dark web is getting darker because like the, the politics are kind of temporary, but um, yeah, the anonymity keeps evolving. Uh, so in, in a way, like it, it, you can kind of be nostalgic about the days of the Silk Road when um, there was only victimless crime in theory being, victimless contraband being sold on the site. And fake murders. Well, fake, the fake murders weren't being sold on the site. Yes, that was yes, Ross's but that, like, was just, past that was just a thing yeah. that happened. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, I think that, that, you know, there's a philosophical shift that needs to happen. Um, you know, an understanding that these digital technological issues are tied to human issues and political issues and cultural issues. And, you know, I agree that there's a disparity, that you find this disparity, but it isn't often and knowledge disparity, you know? Most people are doing, it doesn't require any more than opening your iPhone or, or getting on a Mac. It really doesn't, it requires a desire 
it requires a feeling of need, you know, that there is a reason why we should be looking at these types of stories more closely. There's a reason why they matter, um, reason why they have impact. Um, you know, I had I, I had a, a really long conversation with a with a an editorial writer for the New York Times, um, and really tried to explain to this person like why the situation mattered, and and you know there. It was really, sort of like you said, it was very hard to get through, but it was a philosophical issue. It wasn't like, I wasn't trying to explain PGP to them. You know, I wasn't explaining anything technical to them at all. It was purely, you know, why these issues matter to you. Why? Because your entire life is now on your iPhone or on your laptop. Why that is the same as your life in any other guise, regardless of the technology. So I just think there's a big shift that needs to happen. I mean, I'm in the, you know, obviously the entertainment industry, and it's been very frustrating how resistant my industry has been to new technology. And it, it's philosophical. It's not about, not about the technology itself. It's not about whether they like MP3. You know, Neil Young carps about MP3s. They don't sound good enough. That's not, most people aren't Neil Young carping about the sound quality of MP3s. It's a philosophical, it's like, I don't want to worry about technology. Well, guess what? You have to. You have to is kind of the short answer. You have to because it's where everything is and your life is there too. And you only have to get hacked once and that's, that'll get you going pretty quick. I've had friends who've had their personal photographs pulled off the iCloud and sold by Russian hackers. That sucks, you know? And they got tech savvy really fast. <laughs> so I think it's like, it's like that times, you know, times a billion. I just think these, these issues have ramifications for everyone and, and it's incumbent upon us to, to cover them properly or just don't cover them at all. I mean, it's like, you know, with, with some of the really awful coverage of Silk Road that was just really inaccurate, it would have been better if they hadn't said anything, frankly. Yes. Um, so you've, talk, you've touched a little on the U.S. government's roles in all of these issues. I was wondering if you had anything to say about the Obama administration specifically, and so how that might change after the election. Shh. Forgot a mic. <laughs> um, well, it seems like I, you know, I'm not so much of a political reporter, but it does seem like the White House has kind of um, decided not to pursue backdoors and encryption. They they considered different options. Wasn't there a story just yesterday in the Post about there Washington was a, Post? There was a memo, yeah. Um, that maybe that was this morning that uh, the White House had considered like four different ways to to bypass smartphone encryption, and then decided not to do it, which is you know good for them. Like uh, I think that they kind of have not listen to the intelligence and law enforcement's like um, people on their shoulders telling them that we're you know we're enabling a new era of of crime and, and in fact many in many ways smartphones and the whole digital world has enabled a new era of surveillance that's made it really easy for law enforcement to do their job totally. so you know I, it, it sounds like the Obama administration has taken a pretty reasonable stance on the whole thing be curious to see what happens if Clinton gets in. She's she's historically been very, pretty heavy duty against. Right. Yeah. So and you know Jeb Bush has already said we need to stop uh, demonizing the NSA. That you know, he seems clearly to be pro surveillance in some ways. So um, of course this is gonna if if there is no no action no resolution to this backdoor thing then it's just gonna keep getting brought up by the FBI and the NSA forever. Has, Do has Donald Trump spoken on encryption? Who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I haven't heard. Well, uh, who's that? Um, <laughs> yes? Hi, you guys were talking about uh, innovation on the dark web. Have you seen from your experience now any private capital chasing it? You know how venture capital, private equity, they love early adopters. They love to catch things before they tip. Do you see maybe a, I don't know, a gray web somewhere in the middle where you can go from dark to, to the light, if you will? You think private capital like that can help put better light on this and take some of the better ideas to the public? I'm not quite. I'm. I'm not sure. I, Whether I there's investment that. opportunities. Oh, like, yes. I mean, there's a lot of innovation, but like, not a lot of us well, are exposed to Bitcoin, it. They have Bitcoin. Obviously, Bitcoin has been seized by the the finance world, and uh, but it's you know within the dark net, it's, it's mostly through the journalistic, you know, like the the various whistleblowing, the intercept. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I haven't seen, I think VCs uh, are really scared of yeah. the, the Silk Road. Mostly the role that the whole dark web drug markets have played for them is like, 
let's talk about Bitcoin. Don't mention that that drug thing, like um, because that's like just the bad guys who use Bitcoin. But there are all these wonderful things you can do with it, like buy alpaca socks on this <laughs> website or whatever. Yeah. Like, um, I, but they're certainly getting involved in the privacy business. I mean, they're certainly getting involved in the technolo technology privacy business. Is becoming absolutely right, embraced yeah. by by Wicker, VCs. Wicker has just gotten all this VC yeah. money and a lot of encryption. Which is kind of the same thing, because as Andy said, and it's a really good point. You know, the darknet is some degree is only whatever tool you're using to, to mask your, your location. So Tor, for instance, could be looked at as one component of the darknet. So it's really about privacy and about, you know, the darknet was, is created primarily by people who want to use the anonymous, the, the internet anonymously for whatever their purpose is. Mostly it's government agencies is actually mostly what uses the darknet. So are there people who in the uh, investment in, you know, in VC world who are doing things in the privacy space from a business standpoint? Absolutely, it's getting bigger and bigger every day, for sure. Are there, yes. You talked about, any journalist knows that you, know, you have these wonderful conversations in person and then you put it wherever you put it, whether it's in an article and people are pretty pissed off with you sometimes or whatever. Um, Love-hate relationship, right? What kind of things have you personally experienced? Because covering this, you know, people don't necessarily want you to expose certain things or some people, you know, may have to take issue with what you said or um, what kind of security and, and that sort of things have you guys experienced um, yourselves um, that you've had to deal with? Well, I have to say that I, uh I fear covering the dark net a lot less than I fear saying anything about video games in public ever. <laughs> so there, there is that. For real. Uh, well, how are you guys? I, I don't know. I, um, I suppose I should be more worried about getting hacked myself, but I think I'm, I generally think of myself more as like on the side of the hackers. I'm, I'm more worried about uh, government agencies, honestly, who might compromise my communications, but not in some sort of embarrassing or life-ruining way, just in a secret way that would compromise my ability to do my job. Mm -hmm. um, I, the only exception to that thing about, like, um, I, I have, there are some, like, proponents of assassination markets on the dark web, and I'm not a fan of that idea, strangely. Like, I think that assassination is not cool. And, um, <laughs> and they, I, I've gotten a, a lot of harassment from them, and that's really scary because they like the, they like the idea of killing people. <laughs> so, um, that's, but I'm still here. So, yeah, I mean, for, I mean, I'm you know I'm a filmmaker, and and uh, so for me, it's it's you know, it's just people call you and yell at you for you know saying things they didn't want you to say or whatever. Um, I just take it as part of the job, and uh, I mean, I really care about my subjects. That's the only part about it. I'm sure you guys identify, most of the time I actually care about pretty much everybody I'm talking to on whatever side of the aisle they're on. And so it, you know, it can be a bummer when they're really upset with what you've done. Um, there was a documentary filmmaker who I really admire who said something that I thought was brilliant recently about fairness and balance and about how there's a difference between fairness and balance and that you really try to be fair. And I really, I really related to that. I really try to be fair. I don't really worry so much about being balanced. I mean, um, I think that there's a, especially in the documentary world, there's a, a, a misunderstanding about how documentaries actually work. I think there are so many bad ones where it's like, you know, Fred from over here says five words, and so Ethel from over here has to say five words in response to Fred's words, and you have to give equal measure to both sides, and those equal measures to both sides are what we call balance. But that's, in my opinion, I don't know what you guys think as journalists, that's terrible, terrible storytelling. And it's pandering to this, this notion of sort of equalizing the playing field, which, which doesn't allow any kind of uh, actual intelligent discourse to, to peek through. Uh, it, just, it just neutralizes everything. So I know going in, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to use as many people as I feel are gonna tell the story the way I feel it needs to be told in a manner that's fair, but I, could, I really hope I don't come out with something that appears balanced, because that's just, neutral, it's gray, it has no, and so if you're not going to be balanced, someone is gonna get hurt. You know, why did you talk to more people from over here than over here? Why did you use only this part of my interview? I just feel like that wasn't fair when I said all these other things. It's like I wasn't trying to be balanced, I was just trying to be fair to 
the overall scope of the story. And I think just to go back to what you guys were saying, I mean, the thing about Deep Web is that it's, it's largely about Andy. It's largely about following a journalist trying to make sense out of this story. So I really, you know, and I really tracked a lot of other journalists while I was making the story, like Sarah, like other people who were, who were covering the story thoroughly, and there's a, really just a handful of them. Um, and it was interesting, it was interesting to watch the way they got rebutted by certain people sometimes, the way there was a backlash against them. So I get it. I mean, I guess it, I get that it's a difficult thing to do. I just think that that it's got to be similar for you guys as it is for me as a storyteller, which is you, you know, you, like you guys said, you have to tell the story. It, it's, you know, it's incumbent upon you to tell the story, regardless of whether you're going to stomp on some toes. And I think the times we're living in are so challenging. It's really important that we keep, I, mean, I think, you know, it may have come off as anger, but it was disappointment that I had in, in the New York Times. It was like, why aren't you guys doing a better job of telling this story? This is an important story. And if you're going to tell it at all, tell it thoroughly, or just don't tell it. You know, so it's really, it's just that, that notion of, of going all in and telling the story as best as you can. And who cares if you're going to, you know, maybe not make people happy or piss your bosses off or whatever it is. You know, and with technology stories, it's really important that we start to tell them more because it's really where everything lies right now. Whether we like that or not, it, it is just the world we live in. So, so I think we've run over slightly. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much for thank you. speaking yeah, with me. Thank you.